Uh, open the book of James. Um, James is writing to a very defined set of circumstances that his listeners are going through. And you pick that up right in the very first word, uh, first verse, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Jewish Christians who find themselves in Gentile countries. Uh, the opening paragraph of the handout that I provided talks about the persecution that forced them out of Jerusalem. And when they went into these Gentile countries, uh, trying to start all over, setting up new businesses, they found themselves undergoing terrible circumstances, uh, insurmountable obstacles, shops boycotted, children tormented, wives hassled, uh, the citizens of the town hated them because they were Jews, and the Jews of the town hated them because they were Christians. And so James writes, verse two, 3, consider it joy when you face trials. And there it is. There's who he's, who he's writing to and why he's writing to them. And uh, the question becomes, is that guiding, that sense of trials, is that guiding the entire flow of everything he says? Are we to understand the unfolding paragraphs as sort of shooting off in different directions, a string of pearls with no internal connection? Or are we to understand the unfolding paragraphs as moving through that same set of circumstances? Let me keep talking about trials all the way. And I want to suggest that that's what how we should approach the book of James. Now, there are several internal clues, uh, even before we get to connecting the paragraphs, there are just several internal clues in the way James loses language to say that's what he's doing. For example, we talk about inclusios, uh, and I've, I'm about two thirds of the way down the page. An inclusio is a bookend where we have similar language bookending a large section of scripture. And in the scriptures, whenever you've got inclusio, that tells you everything in between the bookends is on the same theme. So for example, uh, verse two of chapter one, consider it joy when you face trials because trials will develop perseverance. And when perseverance finishes the job, you've got what God is after. You drop down to verse 12, blessed is the man then who will persevere under the trial because he will receive what God intends. Now, when you've got language like that in verses two and three and verse 12, that tells you everything in between those verses is to be connected to trials. If you go to the end of the book and you look at verse chapter five, verse 11, the same language will be uh, repeated. As you know, we consider those blessed. They're, they get what God wants to give them. If they have persevered, okay, you've heard of Job's perseverance, you see what the Lord finally brought about. So again, the theme of perseverance, that's, it's an inclusio to the entire book. So the persevering, responding well in trials, that's, that's how we are to look at how the paragraphs of, of, Job, of uh, James connect. Uh, there's a huge section in the middle of the book, which I will let, try to connect to the theme of trials, but chapter three uh, begins, uh, not many of you should presume to be teachers I'm going to suggest this is not a doctrinal teaching function of a spiritual gift within the church. Because the teacher that he has in mind stumbles and is judged. We stumble in many ways. We who teach, as we stumble, we will be judged. The stumbling, when you get to the end of the inclusio, chapter four, verse 11, is a slandering of other Christians. And this will make a whole lot more sense of what's happening in between chapter three, one and chapter four, 11. Do not slander. You speak against God who is the judge. You, you stand in judge, you insert yourself. You judge the law, you're sitting in judgment. There's only one judge. He's the one that will judge you. And so the speaking of the tongue is a slandering of other Christians related to the trials that are going on. And he will have much to say in there that I'll try to connect it. And when he gets to the end, he says, don't do that. And so we do that. So my, my, my approach to the book of James is to say that James has set us on a course. I'm gonna talk about trials and everything in my book is related to the subject of trials. 
Now, uh, I've given you in the handout a, a very brief set of the flow, uh, roughly about a page worth, the bottom of the first page through almost the bottom of the second page. After that, when I say exposition, I'm going to repeat what you have. Brief. Hello? Okay. And, but I'm going to add some more to it. So when we get to the bottom of page two and we start the bold print, uh, the bold print is basically what's on the previous top part of the page two. Uh, bottom of page one, top of page two. So the bold print um, is that, and I will just try to amplify to show the connections. Uh, the first paragraph we're all comfortable with. We all understand this is trials. And we are to have an anticipation that God is going to do something good in them. Uh, if we will persevere through them, uh, we will find a Christ-likeness emerging. There will be some completeness. Whatever is lacking or immature will be dealt with. So we're very comfortable about that, that this is the theme of trials. Now, because of verse 12, which is that inclusio, we need to understand what comes next connected to trials. And so when James says, if you lack wisdom, we must be careful not to mean if you're trying to decide whether to take a new ministry, if you're trying to decide who to marry. No, it's not wisdom for many decisions of life. It's wisdom about the trial. God is trying to address something in our life to bring us to completion. All right, what is it he's trying to address? If you lack wisdom... Uh, there's a, a way to persevere, to how do I, God, what do you want me to do to move through this trial to get the benefit? If you lack wisdom as to the purpose of the trial or how to persevere through it, ask God. Ask God. And God will give you some insight. Uh, God will reveal to you what it is he's after spiritually to bring about Christ's likeness. Uh, he'll give you a, a way to move through this trial. But when you ask, you must believe. Okay, verse 6, when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. What? You must not doubt that the trial is by God from his hand for the purpose of bringing good in your life. If you think the trial is because you are surrounded by stupid people or it's just your dumb luck, that puts God out of the picture. No, you must believe that this is the hand of a good God for the purpose of bringing you to spiritual maturity. If you doubt that, you're not, you're not going to get any answers from God as to why or what or anything like that. So it's trial. Now, you get down into verse 9 through 11, and you get examples of the kinds of trial that God will use to produce spiritual maturity. Again, the inclusio requires we connect the paragraphs to the theme of trial. And so verses 9 and 11 represent two kinds of trials. In one, uh, a Christian goes for a long period of time with financial difficulty. In the other, a Christian who starts out rich loses a lot of money. And in both of those situations, that's a set of circumstances God will use uh, to bring us to spiritual maturity. So in verse 12 then, if we will persevere through this trial, uh, anticipating that God is doing something good, uh, the inclusio now wraps this up, we will receive a crown of life. And everything in James is, is this life. The crown of life is not something in eternity. Uh, the language he uses was the language that was used to put the garland on the victor's head to show that he was favored. He was the one who, on whom the smiles had occurred. Or it was used in the weddings, the, the, the wreath. Or it was used of, of crowning the king. It was very much a this life sign of favor. And so what James is saying is, if you and I will persevere under the trial, then the quality of life that God wants, that spiritual maturity, that Christ-likeness, uh, God, it comes through. Okay? So there, everything is connected to trials. Now, he still stays on the subject of trials, and you probably know this, that when he gets to verse 13, he continues to use the same Greek word for trials, perosmos. All of our translators move it from trials into temptation, rightly so, but it's still the same Greek word. Because a trial that continues and continues and continues, and you have to keep persevering and persevering and persevering, if you stop persevering, that trial becomes a temptation. 
God, I've been single. Oh, I'm, I'm 35, I'm still single. When are you gonna bring somebody? All of my friends are having sex, they're getting married, and even if they're not getting married, they're still having sex, and I'm trying to hang on to the, you know, how long can I go? Persevering. And if you stop persevering, what was a trial to produce something becomes a source of temptation. And on a business trip to Chicago, at a banquet, you sat around and laughed with a lady from the New York office, and you ended up getting on the elevator together, and what do you know, we got off the same floor, and by golly, we started walking down the hall, and she said, when I heard you want to come in, you know, and have something out of the bar, uh, mini bar, God, it's your fault that I did what I did in Chicago. You pushed the envelope too far. The trial becomes a temptation. Same word, but James is saying, if you find yourself sinning instead of persevering, don't blame God. Don't say you pushed the envelope too far. God is not responsible for that becoming a temptation. God does not tempt, he never tempts. That came because something evil in you each one, verse 14, is tempted when by his own evil desire he was enticed and that desire birthed and blossomed and sinned. Don't be deceived. God only does good. From start to finish, from the birth that get from the word of God that gave you birth into salvation, clear to the end when you are the highest of all of God's creation, the first fruits of all of his creation. From start to finish, God only has good in mind for you. Therefore, verse 19, here needs to be your response. You be quick to listen to the word of God which gave you birth. You be quick to listen to the wisdom that God will give you when you ask for wisdom in this trial. You be quick to listen. You be slow to speak against God and don't you become angry with God for your sin because if you become angry, you'll never arrive at what God's purpose is in this trial. It will never bring about the righteous life, the Christ-likeness, the maturity, the completeness. Instead of blaming God, verse 21, go back and address that evil. Go back and get rid of that moral filth, that evil which was prevalent. Get back to the word of God that birthed you, that was planted in you. That word of God can take you safely through the trial. And again, the word save you must be understood in the Old Testament temporal sense. James is writing out of the Old Testament uh, tradition save you, it will deliver you, it will safely take you through the trial, it will get you safely to the goal that God has in mind. It will save you, get you through it. Uh, this is what he's after. So, but when you go to the word of God and you look for the wisdom as to how to get through this trial, uh, you're addressing the evil and you're bringing yourself back to persevere within it, you must obviously obey the word, you must not simply listen to it. Uh, verse 25, uh, if you look intently into the law that is designed to give you that freedom of life, if you'll not forget what you do, but you'll actually do it, then you'll get the blessing. You'll get the deliverance from the trial. You'll get the crown of life that God has in mind for you. Now in verse 26 and 27, we come to what I think is a hinge in the book. Yes. Um, can, do you mind if I wait until the end to do that? I can stay on a flow because they've only given me 45 minutes. <laughs> uh, but I do, I hope I will have some time. Uh, verses 26 and 27 become the hinge then. Uh, and he will start off by reviewing what he just said. Okay, if you consider yourself religious, if you're gonna become what God wants you to be, the first thing you must do is you must control your tongue. You must not rebuke God, blame God, speak, become angry with God. You must keep a tight rein on your tongue. Then secondly, if you're gonna move through these trials in a proper way, you must commit yourself to two courses of action, which I believe is what he's going to address as he moves into the rest of the letter. You must, first of all, love, 
You must love other people, and he will spend quite a bit of time on that. The phrase, look after orphans and widows, is kind of a euphemism or an idiom for you must love the poor. You must care about the poor. You must care about the marginalized. You must care about those who are not the A-team list, okay? Uh, that's, you have to have that. And then secondly, you must determine that you will not allow the world's way of responding to trials to pollute you. You will keep yourself from being polluted by a worldly approach, by the world's attitudes, the steps, the, the directions the world would go if they were facing the trials. That will pollute you. It will not bring you to what God has in mind. So first, you must love. And in chapter two, he's going to uh, have two, th two parts to this love. First, you must love impartially because that, he says, will reveal your trust, your confidence that God is in control, not the person, the rich person who can help me in the trial. That's the connection. He will, he will say in this section, if you show favoritism, it's a lack of love. It's a sin against love. Uh, whereas to love impartially, instead of showing favoritism, to love impartially means I'm depending on God, not this rich person. Because when he describes the rich person in chapter two, a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. Those are, those are descriptions of the Roman ruling class. This is a church visitor from the community, from the Gentile community, who comes into your Christian meeting and you suddenly see we have a powerful man who has just come into our congregation. This man can solve our trials. This man can get me the permit from City Hall so that I can open up a job. This man can get the police to stop the hooligans from harassing my wife whenever she goes shopping. This man has influence and pull and wealth. This man can solve my problems of the trials. And so you favor him. And James goes on to say, when you do that, you are revealing several things. We could put them negatively or we could put them positively. If I put it negatively, you are first of all revealing you don't trust God. You're trusting this man. If I put it positively, if I say by, by loving impartially, by loving everybody equally, I reveal I'm trusting God, not somebody else. That would be the point of verse 4. You have discriminated, and that word discriminated is the same word that was used back in chapter one. You must not doubt that God is in control. It's exactly the same Greek word. You are now discriminating. You are now trying to figure out, is God really in control or is this man in control? Who can say, help me out in this trial? You are discriminating. You are becoming judges with evil thoughts. You are deciding, with your own motives, who can help me? Instead of just saying, God is my judge. God is my, my savior in this thing. Okay, when you show impartiality, that's the first thing you do. Secondly, uh, when you show uh, partiality, you are revealing a lack of wisdom about who really are godly people. This person that you're favoring is in the class of rich people who, uh, uh, what did he say? He drag you into court, they slander you, whereas the poor people, they are the ones who are really rich in faith. They are the ones you ought to love. It's the single mom with three kids trying to keep a full-time job and raise her kids. That's the one who's walking with God. It's the shy, marginalized teenagers who's struggling with his self-image, who's really struggling to find where, where he fits within Christ and how he can follow Christ. Uh, it's the... It's the man whose car needs four new tires. They're bald, they're gonna blow at any time, but he doesn't have any money. He's the one praying that God will get him to work without having a blowout on the way to church or on the way to the office. Uh, so the, the faith, uh, the, 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 the poor people are the ones who are pr most likely walking with God, okay? Uh, you also show, if you love impartially, uh, that you are willing to obey the word of God, which is what he's talked about earlier. Uh, you're willing to submit yourself to that law. It's a, and the law, most of all, is a law to love your neighbor. Okay? You will keep the royal law found in scripture. Uh, but if you show favoritism, you are a lawbreaker. If you fail to love impartially, but if you love impartially, if you love every neighbor as yourself, you are keeping the law. Uh, and, and doing it. And he, he goes on to say, so this ability to love impartially 
uh, reveals that we have an active trust in God and understanding of scripture, uh, understanding of people and a willingness to scripture mister, submit to scripture and a dependence on grace. And he, car- he carries through that. Uh, now he comes, he still stays with the love theme. He's talked about loving impartially. Now he will talk about loving these widows and orphans, these poor people, tangibly, tangibly. Uh, what good is it if you claim to have faith? Now again, the faith is faith that God is in this trial. Okay, we're, we, we need to keep the, the language consistent in James. This is not faith in Christ for salvation. You claim to have faith that I believe, I have not doubt, God is in this trial, he is working it uh, for purposes of good. I'm gonna persevere through it. You claim to have faith, but you don't have loving deeds. Will that kind of confidence get you through this trial? Will that kind of faith, is that a good faith that will actually get you through this trial? No. Uh, You claim, oh, I believe God's in my trial, but I have a hard heart toward other Christians. No, that'll never get you through the trial. And that's that's kind of where he's going with it here, okay? Uh, Can such faith save him? Uh, You tell me that there's a brother or sister, here's your poor person, here's your widow, here's your orphan, here's your person who, they got one, one pair of cl- cl- suit of clothes that they're wearing and they don't know where their next meal is coming from. And you turn them away. Can that kind, if, is, is there a faith in God and, and his control of your life and his presence in your trials? Is, is that sufficient to get you through the trials or is that faith essentially useless to you? It's essentially dead. It's dead. It's it's, it'll, it won't get the benefit that God's after, okay? His point is our willingness to love others who are in the trial with us shows that we have a faith, a living faith that God is present in this trial and it's a faith that's gonna get us through it, okay? The only way he's gonna say that, that, that you know that your trust in God in the trial is alive and active is if you see yourself loving others who are going through the trial and being seriously affected by it. Now, somebody objects in verse 18. Someone will say, no, I don't buy that. I think somebody can have a faith that God is in their trials, but not necessarily have that show in loving deeds to other people. And James says, well, you're wrong, okay? Show me your confidence in God without loving actions, and I will show you by my loving actions that I genuinely believe God is present in this. And he will give three examples. The examples of the demons, the examples of Abraham, and the examples of Rahab. And his point in each example is all three knew God, but the only ones whose faith really carried them through, believing that God was active in the environment or the circumstances, were Abraham and Rahab. The demons believe in God. They have no goodness. They have no love. They shudder. They tremble. Abraham believed in God. He believed to the point he was willing to offer his son Isaac. But he had already demonstrated the reality of that belief by his loving actions toward Lot, to give Lot first choice of the land, and by his loving hospitality to God and the two angels who were on their way to Sodom. And it was his faith that was combined with his deeds of love that made him a righteous friend of God. Rahab said to the spies, we know that we don't have a chance against your God. We've heard what happened on Transjordan to Sihon and Og. Our hearts are melting within fear and I will protect you. I will lovingly keep you hidden. And as a result, her faith in God combined with it took her through the trial. And that's James's point that we, we it is a, a, a our active faith that God is present, shown through our willingness to engage ourselves in love with others who are going through the same situation that proves we have the kind of faith that will take us through this trial. So his first point is you must love the widows and the orphans. You must love the marginalized. You must love the poor. That love 
will show that you have a realization. God, you are bringing this into us, into all of our situations, and we are going to care for one another. That takes him through his first section of love. Now, the second point was you must keep yourself unspotted from the world. And when we move into chapter 3, almost the rest of the book, the word world, cosmos, that's going to start showing up. We're in a section now where we're going to, where we're going to see the world's wisdom. We're going to talk about being a friend of the world. We're going to talk about a world of evil. The word world in phrases will keep reappearing in this particular section. And one of the ways that the world responds to trouble when it's being persecuting them is they lash out against other people who they think are aggravating the situation, causing the trouble. And that's what James has in mind when he moves into chapter three and starts talking about teaching and the use of the tongue. This is not a spiritual gift teaching. It's not doctrine, because if that were the case, we, we can't make sense out of the paragraphs that follow. But if we understand it, that there is somebody in the church who is going to stand up and he's going to tell you all what you ought to be doing so that we don't have so much trouble in this city that we're in. He is going to stand up and instruct the other Christians as to how to shape up so that we don't have so much trouble. Okay? So it's looking at those who are saying, you Christians are causing our problem. And this is why the inclusio will talk about if you slander, if you are so frustrated with other Christians and you abuse them verbally because you want them to get with the program, uh, you will be judged. You will be judged. You are sinning against your people. And this will make a lot more sense out of the paragraphs as we go through. So it's looking at internally inside a church how we act toward others when we're all feeling the pressure, uh, the effects of persecution. How do we treat each other? And James's point is, man, don't be quick to stand up in the congregational meeting and ream out the rest of the Christians as to what they're doing wrong, okay? Uh, the only one who should presume to instruct is somebody who is in control of all areas of his life. And you can see how this would happen. I mean, in a contemporary sense. If our church is being abused in our community, well, somebody could get the idea, well, I know why that's the case. It's because some of you Christians, your son is the star goalie, but you won't let him play on Sunday. And so the select soccer team didn't get to go to state because the substitute goalie led in three, three shootout goals and the rest of the teams now think that, you know, us Christians, you know. Or some of you, when you go to PTA and the subject of homosexuality uh, emphases within certain classes or books in the library, you, you just stand up and make an idiot out of yourselves, okay? And you bring the abuse on the, in other words, you're, you're bad PR for the rest of us Christians, okay? Um, uh, some of you, 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 you go late to family gatherings because you, you hang around at church. Uh, I mean, skip a service and get there for the lunch so that they don't have to schedule lunch at 2 o'clock to accommodate. You know, I mean, you're causing us problems. You're aggravating our situation. And James says, until you are a perfect man, until you are spiritually mature in the area of controlling your tongue, until you are complete, don't stand up to teach. Don't be the advice giver. Uh, and the honest truth is the hardest area that we ever learn to control is our tongue. So most of you sit still in the pew and don't presume to be the counselor for the church. He goes on to talk about, you know, small things, if they're controlled, can have a very positive effect. He talks about ships and horses. Well, the tongue is small, but we can't control it. Instead, it is a world of evil. It is the world's way of causing evil in these kinds of situations. It sets on course life, uh, uh, what does it say? It sets on the course his whole life on fire. Once you start this verbal abuse of other Christians and sin against them, you can never take it back. It's out there, it's stuck, and you are forever perceived and they forever resent uh, the, the damn harm you did them. So because it's so likely that we will sin with our tongue, we should avoid telling others until we find that our life is consistent, that there is a, a, a unity to our life, that there is a, an ongoing evidence of the kind of uh, behavior that shows we are mature. Instead of uh, salt water out of springs and figs out of uh, olives and grapes out of these kinds of things, okay? 
So verse 13, he's still on the same subject. Do you consider yourself a counselor? Do you consider yourself somebody who has the wisdom for the church? Again, this is not doctrine. This is what steps should we take. The language he says, who is wise and understanding. Old Testament words to say, I know what we should do, that's wisdom, and I know how to get there, that's understanding. I know what direction we should be going, that's wisdom, and I know what steps we should take to get there, that's understanding, okay? Do you consider yourself a person who has that for the church? Well, let us see, first of all, that you bring peace that you are, you are humble. We see your behaviors. Instead, what we're noticing is that you are a envious, ambitious, self-centered, divisive, polarizing person, and you are boasting about having wisdom, but what you're really denying is you are in self-denial of the truth that you are not a wise person, you are being led by the devil. And the evidence is that when you get up and talk, disorder and sin and division and everything else, fights and quarrels break out within the congregation. Uh, You are divisive when you stand to speak. If you want to be a teacher to the church during a time of trial, uh, let us see the gentle humility and the godliness that consistently comes out of your life. He's still on the subject of how do we handle these things within the church. Okay? And this carries over into chapter 4. Why do we find ourselves fighting within the church? Why do you have fights and quarrels? Okay? The reason is because your desires are being frustrated by other people in the church. At least you, that's your perception. What causes fights and quarrels? They come from your desires, your, what you want, and it's wrestling and battling within you and you're trying to get everybody else on your agenda, okay? And now verse two, I find the NASB punctuation better. Uh, the NASB will read verse two, something like this. You want something, but don't get it, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot have what you want, so you quarrel and fight. That seems to make a better sense. When you find, uh, basically, you're you're trying to manipulate and force people instead of just asking God. If you do ask God, it's self-centered. You have your own agenda. Your concerns are not according to his will, and so it's not coming. You are basically operating according to the world. This is the world's pollution. You adulterous people, don't you know that adopting this worldly approach is revealing an animosity and enmity and antagonism toward what God is doing, what he wants. If you choose to become a friend of the world, if you choose to operate this way, polluted by the world, then you become an enemy of God. But, and again, I would go with the NASB uh, reading here, which says uh, that God jealously longs for our spirit to stay with him. And he provides grace and blessing to those who will move in that direction. So when he comes to verse 7 now, he's going to summarize this section on how to handle it internally within a church in terms of the tongue. And he will summarize it and said uh, that instead of being angry with others, submit to the fact that this trial is something that God is doing in your life. Mourn, accept the fact that life's going to be difficult, and don't abuse, don't sit in judgment on the other believers. Don't demand, verse seven, that things be done your way, except that life will be difficult, circumstances will be sorrowful, Uh, resist Satan's attempt to get you to demand your own way, believe that your circumstances are from God, Uh, humble yourself before the Lord, don't sit in judgment on other Christians because you are slandering them and God will deal with you. So there he is to that spot. The first way then that the world attempts to solve difficulties is by lashing out at other people and trying to get them to act better so that we don't continue to have our problems. The second way that we are polluted by the world to to solve trials is to try to seek to become wealthy enough to insulate ourselves against them. Uh, We try to protect ourselves. If I have enough money, then I can solve the trials in one way or another. And so the world's way of coping with difficulties is also by trying to gain the wealth that will enable them to handle the difficulties. And James's point is, is, don't think that that's a route that will get you out of the trials. 
First of all, don't arrogantly presume that you can seek wealth and it'll come. You can't. You cannot predict the future. God alone controls it. And I've indicated the chiasm. Uh, that's in verses 13 through 17. Uh, it's, it's basically arrogant, which is his point to think that you as people in business can gather enough wealth that will help you in the trials. You cannot predict that that will happen. Even if even trying to make it happen will involve you in sins that is going to bring God's judgment to you. Attempts to insulate yourself from difficulties by becoming rich will simply lead you to other sins and God's judgment will come on you. And I, I'll skip past, uh, I've given you the points that are in there. So instead of, uh, he is talking now about two areas in which we are adopting the world's way, being polluted by the world's approach to solving trials. One is uh, blaming others, trying to get them to change. Second one is trying to become rich to insulate ourselves. Now he moves positively in chapter five, verse seven. Uh, uh, and he says, instead of the polluting ways, grumbling against others, compromising your integrity to alleviate suffering, just patiently persevere. There's the inclusio, persevere until God acts. Uh, these verses are in A, B, A, B pattern, verses seven to 12. So you read verse seven and eight, wait patiently. Verse 10 and 11, A, A, wait patiently. And then, uh, B, uh, don't grumble against other believers, verse nine, and then B, uh, don't compromise your integrity by f false oaths so as to get money. And so his point is wait patiently, uh, hang in there, God will return, and show your patience by not doing either of the two things that I have mentioned. Do not uh, slander, do not grumble other believers, uh, verse nine, and uh, uh, verse 12, do not put false oaths out there to convince people uh, that you will follow through on something, which is to compromise an in integrity, okay? Then finally, he closes off his book. Hey, are you in trouble? There it is. Are you in trouble? Yeah, we are. All right, pray, pray. Talk to God about it. If you're happy, sing songs. Get God into this, okay? Now, if you've got people who are sick, you know, here's how to deal with it. Pray for them. Uh, the prayer of faith. Let me just throw out what I, what I understand that to be. Faith is always a response to something God has already said. Faith is always my acting on a promise God has made. So a prayer of faith is a prayer that is operating on some prior indication from God what his will is. So you call for the elders. The elders spend a little bit of time in the presence of the Lord saying, Lord, what is your intention? How do you want us to pray? And if the elders perceive that God's intention is to heal this person, then they are to boldly ask for that in their prayer. They are to pray a prayer of faith. He refers to Elijah. That's how Elijah stopped the rain and brought the rain. Elijah had a prior promise from God in Deuteronomy that if Israel so departed from God in the worship of foreign idol idols, and if they so departed from God in terms of his will for the nation, that God would dry up the heaven bronze, brass, drought, animals dying. And Elijah, who reflected on the Torah, on Deuteronomy, at some point is saying, God, if there was ever a time when that ought to happen in our country, it would seem to be now. At which point God said, yes, you go to Ahab. You tell him it's not going to rain. What made Elijah think he could pull that off? Can you go down to the Orange County Weather Bureau and say, until I give the word, you weather people might as well go home, we're not gonna have any more rain. I mean, they laugh, you know, I mean, like Haddon said, don't pretend like this happened all the time in the Old Testament. I mean, the reaction Elijah got was when he left Ahab's court, Ahab turned to the people around and said, who's that kook? Okay, so it's Elijah is operating on the faith that God has already made a statement. That's how I understand 
Uh, what's happening here. Uh, the last paragraph either is a conclusion to this section about praying for somebody, or it may be a conclusion to the whole book. So that's kind of how I've sensed that there is a continuous flow and focus to the book of James. And when I come to individual sections, it seems to make more sense of the internal content of a section and especially of the connections between sections. All right, now I bought myself about eight minutes for questions. Jim? Yeah, I, I think I'd have to do in a sermon what I did here. I'd have to say in the, in the language that James is writing in, that's the phrase I usually use instead of in the Greek. In the language that James is writing in, he uses the same word. This might be a time when on a PowerPoint I show in, in red lifting out the word trials and tempted and tempted and tempted. And I might even put in a Greek in parentheses around it to show it's the same Greek word threading through it. And then I would just simply try to explain there are times if we don't persevere where the trial will become a temptation. Uh, but James is still connecting his flow in this way. Yeah, because yeah. I, I don't know a better translation English-wise to use. God is, is tempting me or God is trying me. I mean, is, is that the way you would... Yeah, you still got to get to the evil part. When, when, when being tried, God is trying to see if he can get me to sin. He's pushing the envelope to see how far he go before I crack. The word tempting has to come in there. In, in English, tempting carries the connotation of sin. While nobody in the pew cares about Martin Luther's view of uh, this book, uh, is there anything you would do to help tie in the theme of grace or uh, any way you address that? Uh, the word grace appears. God gives grace to those who will do what he's saying. But it's, it's, it's a quote of the book of Proverbs. And in the book of Proverbs, it's the opposite of, a, instead of, what does it say? Uh, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 6, God opposes, but he graces. So the word grace is he rewards. It's, it's back again to what James is on. There is a crown in this life. There is a deliverance from the trial. There is a Christ-likeness, a maturity. This is a grace that God is trying to bring in. Uh, this is, this is where, how I understand the word grace to fit in this. If you're thinking in terms of grace through the salvation that comes by faith in Christ, I think that's all preliminary to this book. This is a book addressed to believers who are believers, but who need to know how to have, get through a trial. So I, I would keep the sense of grace as James uses it in the book. Will you bring more sovereignty into it? I, I think that, yeah, the, sovereign, I, the trials are sovereign. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a recognition God is sovereign. He, he, he's in control. He's, he knowingly has brought these set of circumstances because he is producing something in me that is going to be very good, and I want that. Here's how I get it. Yeah. Uh, the latter is what I would gravitate toward. Because that's what he starts out with in chapter one. There is a maturity, there is a completeness. You will not lack anything. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be yeah, another good way of putting it. Draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. That's what you're after. There's not a promise of a change of circumstances, promise of a change of me. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.